Warning, tonight's presentation, although edited for YouTube, contains imagery and subject matter some may find disturbing. While our program is educational, we still feel that viewer discretion is advised. You might remember the first game that you ever played that disturbed you, since it often comes from a unexpected place. Huddled by the family console, illuminated only by the glow of a television, is a place where many of us remember our first alone encounter with a unnerving part in a video game. Maybe it's a unassuming Nintendo title that got way too real for some reason, or a graphic scene in a shooting game that hit a little too close to home. Or if you're like me, you're doing research into the weird part of the internet and stumbled across something I really shouldn't have in the search for the worst. On one hand, these games make you think, and they seriously make you think critically about the subject matter that they want to talk about, for better or for worse. Some of these titles, while disturbing, offer a very real experience that's worth having, even if it's a little unpleasant. However, I will admit that a lot of these games have done nothing more but unnerve me while also being disgusting, not in the sense of story, but in real life. This video will be done in an iceberg format, which, to quickly explain, items at the top of the iceberg are going to be more well known and generally less disturbing due to having their own mainstream appeal and coverage. But as we move down the iceberg, items will become more obscure, covering darker subject matter and generally getting more nonsensical and bizarre until we reach the very bottom, where we will even cover media that caused real-world harm or were made by bad actors with criminal intent. Sometimes a game isn't disturbing because of what's in the game, but rather what it says about the person that made it and the context it gives onto their later horrific actions. However, before we get into that, I have to thank today's sponsor for helping me keep the lights on and being incredibly understanding with how long it took to make this video, Kami Koto Knives. We have been using these professional quality knives for the past month, and I have to say that these are the most premium knives I have ever used. Kami Koto makes high quality Japanese steel kitchen knives using traditional techniques honed over 800 years from Japan. Kami Koto also only uses steel sourced from mills in Japan such as those for the prefectures of Nagata, Ibaraki, and Kanagawa. Each order comes in this ashwood box with a personal letter of authenticity, which just says that a person has individually inspected each of the knives that I received. That and each one comes with a lifetime guarantee, which again just adds to the premium feel. Even the smell I noted was oddly intoxicating and nice. If you're interested, the set that I got is the Kenpeki knife set, which comes with a Nakiri vegetable knife, a slicing knife, and a utility knife. With over a hundred years of experience between the bladesmiths that worked on these, these knives have an insanely sharp edge, which they recommend you get a whetstone to maintain. Putting my money where my mouth is, I even got a set for my stepdad as a Christmas gift, which you can see him using here and helping me film. Thanks for the avocado, dude. Kami Koto is currently having a extended sale, which on top of that, you can get an additional $50 off of any purchase you make with my special discount code, which you can see on screen now as gamikoto.com slash TCR, or use promo code TCR to save an extra $50 at checkout on the best damn kitchen knives I've ever used. If this is up your alley, then here you go. Cool damn kitchen knives. With that said, feel free to sit back, relax, turn down the lights, and prepare to be scared as we present the definitive Disturbing Games Iceberg, uh, uh, part one. The first layer of the definitive Disturbing Games iceberg is going to be internet horror. To quickly give a definition, in this case, internet horror is any piece of media that has been discussed and dissected so much that, through its communal understanding, loses a bit of its edge. Basically, if Matt Pat has made a video about it, or if you've seen this thing all over the internet, this is probably where it belongs. 
If I happen to miss any games in this layer, feel free to let me know in the comments and I'll try to rectify that issue in the next video. With that said, let's begin. Mortal Kombat has nothing disturbing about its story unless the abstract concepts of invasions from another world really pokes at the mind. Instead, what shoots this franchise into infamy is the conversation it started. Before Mortal Kombat, there was no standard rating system like with film. Fearing the same kind of backlash the film industry received, Nintendo implemented strict regulations placed on the developers that hoped to make games for what was then a system more popular than a family computer. Mortal Kombat made rounds in the arcades and was exceptionally bloody and violent for the time. The ending kills known as fatalities quickly gained mainstream attention, which hit a boiling point when it was released on the Super NES and Sega Genesis. The Sega version of the game had a code which re-enabled the blood that was disabled permanently on the Super NES. I'm all for anti-censorship, but back then, there was no ESRB, meaning that kids could actually just buy whatever if they knew where to look. This culminated in a Senate hearing, with Nintendo and Sega also in attendance. Sega, funnily enough, had tried to implement their own rating system several weeks before the Senate hearing in order to seem a bit more progressive on the issue, which would have worked if not for Nintendo saying this. You sit here and buy this nonsense that this Sega Night Trap game was somehow only meant for adults. I'm not the fact of the matter thing. is, this is a copy of the packaging. There was no rating on this game at all when the game was introduced. Small children bought this at Toys R Us, and he knows that as well as I do. When they started getting heat about this game, then they adopted the rating system and put ratings on it. But today, just as I'm sitting here, you can go into a Toys R Us store or a Walmart or a Kmart, and you know as well as I do that you can buy this product and no one. Certainly no sales clerk at retail is going to challenge you. Other games were discussed here too, including Night Trap, a B-movie horror game that has its own cult following. The results of this hearing were clear. Either you regulate yourself or the government will do it for you, which led to the creation of the ESRB as we know it today. Unfortunately, Mortal Kombat kept pushing the boundaries of bloody media, each game getting more violent and focused on human suffering. I mean, this is whatever, but have you played or even seen Mortal Kombat 11? Each fatality is flashy and over the top. There are several where your character will panic just before brutally being tortured to death. One Mortal Kombat 11 developer revealed that he was diagnosed with PTSD after working on the game because of the violence inside and the real world graphic material he had to study in order to accurately animate some of these deaths. Which is why it's still hard for Creepy to get into the series as of late. As someone who plays and talks about fighting games with him all the time, I can personally attest to this. Call of Duty and Activision have been no stranger to controversy in recent years, especially when concerning the rights of their female employees. Bobby Kotick, you belong in prison. However, when Modern Warfare 2 dropped with a content warning and the option to skip a mission called No Russian, it likely sparked the imaginations of parents and politicians alike. In this level, the player is a CIA operative in deep cover, and has the option to endgame an entire airport to gain the series antagonist's trust while civilians run helplessly from a hail of sensitive subject matter. Even though the player is never forced to use any of their heavy firepower on the airport goers, this is probably the most ballsy Call of Duty has ever gotten since the AC-130 mission in Modern Warfare 1, which in his own right would probably be on this iceberg if not for this mission being more relevant to current societal fears relating to active shooters. Ever since the COD franchise has gone for the action-packed route, while doing their best to ignore the real-world questions relating to modern military violence, the whole series, at least in my humble opinion, felt like it lost something. However, especially today, looking back, No Russian stands out as an unsettling piece of media in a franchise that has all since lost its subtlety. 
Bioshock is a cautionary tale which criticizes objectivism, a philosophy that encourages all people to act exclusively in their own self-interest. To individuals like Ayn Rand, the city of Rapture would have been like a dream come true, promising entirely laissez-faire markets and a society which was both literally and figuratively sink or swim. What this actually leads to is suffering and mayhem. Unsustainable living and working conditions lead to revolts, and the discovery of a substance called Adam turns the population of Rapture into gene-mutated and drug-addicted splicers. There has been tremendous pressure to regulate this plasmid business. There have been side effects, blindness, insanity, death. But what use is our ideology if it is not tested? The market does not respond like an infant. Shrieking at the first sign of displeasure, the market is patient, and we must be too. The game takes place in the aftermath of this chaos, placing you in constant danger of mutants, freaks, and the city itself threatening to fall apart. An encounter with Rapture's founder, Andrew Ryan, which funnily enough is an anagram of Ayn Rand, leads to a twist ending which questions the player's free will, and suggests that they may have been inexorably linked to the underwater city from the beginning. While this game is a first-person horror-themed shooter, what really makes it disturbing is the philosophy behind the game that fills out the world. Every inch of rapture is the result of an ideology that directly states altruism and being a good person is antithetical to human nature. Wisecrack did a great video on this called The Philosophy of Bioshock if you're interested in looking further into this. Created by Nintendo, Majora's Mask is an entry in the Legend of Zelda franchise. Although this game is a bit different from every other title as it has darker themes and has some unsettling things that are disturbing when you really focus on it. The player has roughly 53 real life minutes in order to save the world, otherwise this horrifying moon will destroy everything. Link can return to the first day which saves the player's progress and major accomplishments permanently such as the collection of maps, masks, music, and weapons. The disturbing part is that the cleared puzzles, keys, and minor items will be lost, as well as any rupees not in the bank, and almost all characters will have no recollection of meeting Link. This essentially implies that every time Link resets the time, he's undoing all the help and good he's done. Considering this is primarily made for kids, the atmosphere is thick, and some animations and designs are downright unsettling. Over the years, Majora's Mask has been a popular subject of creepypastas like Ben Drowned and theories which may imply that Link is dead and the world of Majora's Mask might be the afterlife. It's no wonder why this is discussed so much on the internet. Luna Game is a controversial project made by an anonymous author back in the early days of the Brony fandom. Posted on Equestria Daily, this game scared the shit out of many unsuspecting players. Basically, the first version is a Mario-style platformer with upbeat music, only for a jump scare featuring a Zalgo, Pinkie Pie, or Apple Bloom comes out of nowhere, leaving behind extra files on the user's computer. The game downloaded these files onto your system, which led people into believing that this could be malware or some sort of malicious program, which, yeah, isn't that great when most of the people were tricked into downloading this game in the first place. This caused so much panic back in the day that the creator of Equestria Daily, the number one brony site of its time, Sophisto, took it down and made a rule against any fully downloadable games being on the site at all. According to a post by the original creator, he was just playing around in Game Maker and just trying to make video games, and noticed that the program allows users to download images onto the player's computer. He also went on to say that he has some deep regrets featuring the franchise. For example, apparently he stole a bunch of assets that he used to make these projects. There are several different Luna games out there, but all function on a similar premise and feature easter eggs which has become sort of a thing that the community try to find. In 2021, there's so many that I don't really have a lot of time to go through all of them, but a lot of them involve graphic gore or some sort of horrible thing happening to Luna, the character the game series is named after. However, at the time, these games were what made the internet a much different place, and it felt like you were playing something right out of a creepypasta. Hell, I'm pretty sure Luna Game inspired quite a few of those creepypastas. 
Amnesia was massive back in the day and helped launch the career of the world's largest independent creator, PewDiePie. To start, Amnesia is a welcome departure from your expectation of first-person shooters. Instead of gunning down wave after wave of demons, aliens, super soldiers, or what have you, you instead find yourself running and hiding from monsters that can one-shot you. Instead of playing as a one-man army, you instead get to learn what it means to be truly vulnerable against a horde of creatures who can hurt you simply by entering your line of vision, which slowly drains your sanity. Amnesia isn't the first game of its type, but it definitely was the doom to Penumbra's Wolfenstein. The title that popularized the genre and opened the floodgates to the cat and mouse style of gameplay you'll eventually find yourself immersed in with titles like Outlast and Alien Isolation or even Slender, the plot in and of itself is undoubtedly a point of debate on whether you're the hero in all of this, as the details you uncover about your past as a freshly awakened amnesia victim reveal more disturbing clues about the questionable actions you took to land yourself in the predicament you awaken in. With a sanity meter that decreases when you're left in the dark or staring at monsters, you find yourself juggling resources like you do in many survival horrors, between matches for candles, fuel for your lantern, or medicine for your health. Everything works against you and the effects of it are all stressful, but in the right ways, solidifying this title as an integral part in the legacy of video game horror. Mad Father is an RPG maker game where you play as an 11-year-old girl named Aya who breaks into her father's secret laboratory to uncover the horrifying truth of his research. Mad Father became immensely popular after horror lets players like PewDiePie covered it in full. What makes this game a bit disturbing is the fact that all the deaths and horrors found in Aya's father's lab is being witnessed by a child. Whenever a child gets involved with horror, it brings the disturbing factor up quite a bit. Nowadays, compared to other RPG maker games out there, Mad Father is very much outdated. However, it's still a classic that games take inspiration from, even to this day. Postal 1 is a deeply disturbing title, and I'm not just trying to say that to inflate the value this video may have. I genuinely think that, at least compared to its sequel, Postal 2, that Postal 1 is a creepy little game. While Postal 2 is a wacky game made by Running With Scissors that features politically incorrect humor and is a general satire of the gaming community in 2003, Postal 1 takes after its namesake. Done in a 2D isometric art style, the Postal dude feels compelled to kill every person on screen in order to make it to the next level. Each level transition features quotes from the decaying mind of our protagonist. There is no music, only ambient noise of gunfire, screams, and nature, which is like a cacophony of noise that is nothing but agony. This is a morbid title that can be incredibly draining to play, whether you're talking about on a emotional level or on just general tedium, it depends on your sensibilities. In 1997, I could easily picture this being one of the more disturbed games that you can play, especially with how seriously this game presents the act of going postal. The final level of this title takes place at an elementary school where kids are completely immune to the firepower the Pulsal Dude brings. This seemingly causes him to have a mental breakdown where the game ends on a mildly ambiguous note. The sound design and ambience alone are enough to put the audience on edge, but when you're looking at the axe on screen and then you remember that Columbine happened only a few short years after this game was made, it makes this title retroactively a lot more unsettling, especially since it is more relevant to what's going on now than it has in its own time. I am by no means trying to imply that there's a correlation between violent video games and real world violence, just that the fact that this game depicts real world violence in a way that's, I don't know, just overwhelming kind of makes this title a bit more disturbing than many of the others on this list, despite being so well known thanks to its more popular sequel. Released on June 1st, 2015, Hatred immediately drew controversy since it's a top-down twin-stick shooter where you play a... shooter. The main character, we would argue, is cartoonishly over-the-top and not representative of the teens that are typically involved in more infamous incidents. The main character is nameless. He just wants to kill for the sake of killing in a stylized black-and-white world. 
Normally a game like this would not be that well known, however because Steam actually banned this game from Greenlight only to reverse that decision due to the plethora of other horrible games that actually made it through, many people were exposed to this title and made many videos making this THE messed up game that most people know. Five Nights at Freddy's, created by Scott Cawthorn, who's actually involved in some drama right now, which I won't discuss here. However, if you want to go look it up for yourself, I fully encourage you to do that. The only reason why I'm not covering it is because I just don't have the time to do the proper research to give you guys a informed look like you really deserve. With that said, Five Nights at Freddy's is still a strange game to say the least. There's not much in terms of gameplay, basically you watch cameras and manage a draining battery while a series of animatronics from hell with different quirks and behaviors try to kill you. Over the years, FNAF has exploded into tons of merchandise, other independent projects, people talking about it, theories, videos rising in the tens of millions of views, and of course, several entries, some better than others. What makes this game really disturbing though is the lore, which is presented in a cryptic manner which involves dead kids and the infamous bite of 87. This mystery unfolds across Scott's games and books, which captivated many, giving it actual mainstream success. I have to admit that when something becomes so well known and mainstream, it's hard to find the once disturbing themes to be that disturbing because you're so exposed to it that it stops making you feel uncomfortable. Despite this, however, Five Nights at Freddy's is likely the first messed up game that not only disturbed many kids and teens, but helped fund the careers of many YouTubers on this platform, and it's hard not to at least admire that much. Five Nights has also inspired a lot of fan games such range in quality. One of the fan games that I personally had a lot of fun with was One Night at Flumpty's 2, which looks absolutely nightmarish. However, even with that game, the creator is involved in some pretty intense accusations and drama himself. And yeah, you know, I'm starting to think that this franchise just might be cursed. PT, or Playable Teaser, created by 7780 Studio, it is a walking sim part ARG experience that grappled the internet's attention after it dropped for free on the PlayStation Store on August 12, 2014. PT features many strange puzzles with unclear solutions, some of which even require you to know another language. Despite being designed to take a week for the collective internet to complete, a few geniuses managed to actually complete it in hours after it released, revealing that PT is a Hideo Kojima and Germo del Toro pitch to Konami for a new Silent Hill game. PT features just enough disturbing imagery to really get the imagination going without ever giving us a full picture, inspiring many other horror games in its wake, like Visage, Layers of Fear, and the cancelled game Alice in Road. Unfortunately, shortly after this, Kojima was fired from Konami, and according to our research, Kojima and Konami mutually decided to end the contract, but not before Konami removed access to Kojima's office from him, removed the employees working with him, and even took his name off the credits of Metal Gear Solid V of Phantom Pain, which Kojima had been working on for years. Despite how intense and important PT is to the horror game genre, Konami removed it off the PlayStation Store and wielded copyright like a hammer against anyone trying trying to preserve its legacy. As a direct result, PlayStation with PT still installed on them are still selling for hundreds of dollars, more than what a normal PS4 would sell for. That number was in the thousands, however, when it was first removed. Being trapped deep in space on an abandoned claustrophobic space freighter with nobody coming along to help is a very harrowing thing in and of itself. Now toss in an alien threat of reanimated dead abominations that could show up anywhere at any time. Not good enough? Okay, try wreathing them in razor-sharp appendages and give them a desperate homicidal appetite for your mutilation. Make them impervious to conventional combat, forcing you to think outside the box where acts of dismemberment are your only means for survival. Now you're looking at one hell of a cocktail. Let's say your mind has been compromised by an ancient, unimaginable artifact from god knows where that alters your consciousness so you can't even be sure if what you're seeing is real at any given time. Well, that must mean you're playing Dead Space. It's a survival horror sci-fi adventure that has it all. An atmosphere so thick you could choke on it, enough lore to inspire two sequels, two animated companion pieces, and several novels and comics to boot. Hell, it even has a first-person rail shooter. With aspects like no HUD and a diegetic inventory system, you can really see yourself living in the world. It's so well thought out and tangible. 
Though unfortunately, by the time you get to Dead Space 3, what the series has become is the real nightmare. Despite that, the series still lends itself to the horror genre in its own beautifully disgusting way. You begin as everyman Isaac Clark, on his way to perform a maintenance mission where your girlfriend is stationed and as soon as you arrive, things go south. For instance, take in how gross the enemy monsters are. The art team at Visceral Games did a lot of anatomy studies, including looking at car crash corpses, which is a morbid task and the results produced some very disturbing beasts. The game makes you feel vulnerable, has you staring at every shadow, stalking up and down derelict hallways asking what the hell just happened. As the story unravels, you're faced with unspeakable odds as you desperately try to fix part after part aboard the Ishimura. The sequel is almost just as good. Almost. Almost? I can't- Oh, this isn't the script. I- Mm-mm. I- I'm protesting this one. <clears throat> Dead Space 2 is a bit of a departure from the suffocating setting of the Ishimura, though don't worry you do go back to it for a time, and it's much more action focused. You're also not as isolated since you're now in a populated space station. The third Dead Space, well, you fight a drill head as a boss, and the final boss is literally a fucking moon. Play it for yourself if you do want to learn more about Isaac, but do it knowing it has long since abandoned its roots and by now is just another sci-fi clusterfuck shoot 'em up. But no matter where the series went, Dead Space 1 will always go down as one of the better survival horror titles of the modern era of video games. Earthbound is a game that I have never played, but through creepypastas and word of mouth alone, I think I can pretty much piece together the plot. It's one of those legendary games that everyone holds in high regard and is definitely a must play before you die. Even if I don't have any personal connection to Earthbound, plenty of the games that I hold in very high regard today were directly inspired by this title, and as a result, I owe it a lot of respect. The Earthbound community today continues to discuss and theorize about the bizarre themes and story to this day. While a majority of Earthbound frames its content as charming and fun, the game's final area is one that stuck out into the minds of many players as a real trippy, nonsensical trip from hell. First, the souls of the main characters need to be implanted into robots so that they can travel back to the past and reach the Devil's Machine. This is a crucial step to confronting Gygus, the embodiment of evil, and Earthbound's final boss. While the Earthbound battle scenes were already pretty psychedelic to begin with, the final boss goes the extra mile with a representation of the inconceivable monster based on a personal childhood trauma suffered by the game's director when he accidentally walked into a movie theater playing the Japanese horror mystery film The Military Policeman and the Dismembered Beauty. The young Itoi had unknowingly entered the wrong movie theater and witnessed a murder scene and mistook it for something far less less consensual and far more sexual, inspiring the design for Gygus, and some of the more questionable dialogue from the fight. As the fight progresses, the background gets more intense and insane, Gygus becoming more distorted until the screen looks like this, and your only option that's left is for one of your party members to pray for her party's safety, hoping that whatever is out there might take some mercy on her friends. And while I personally don't find Earthbound to be that disturbing, I also didn't grow up with Earthbound. Back in the time Earthbound was released, a lot of Nintendo games and properties were largely marketed more towards young kids. And if I was like a 9 or 10 year old and this is what I was going up against, I'd be frightened too. Little Nightmares is a series of games where you play as small children exploring a surreal dystopian hell with a very unclear speculative story that people still talk about today. To YouTubers Gamersalt and Super Horror Bro, I want to give a special shout out for doing an amazing job giving their interpretations on what exactly is going on here. Once again, we are dealing with a game where all the horrors are being experienced from the perspective of a small, malnourished child, hence the name Little Nightmares. But before I get into why Little Nightmares is disturbing, I just kind of need to give you a little bit of the hell that I went through just researching this. Just to give an idea of how confusing things can get, there are two different female characters, both wearing yellow raincoats that obscure almost all their identifying features, and as far as I'm aware, none of that is explicitly stated within the games that they are 
in. Like, that's not confusing and obtuse as hell. While playing as a yellow raincoat girl named Six in the first game, you'll encounter leeches that constrict and drain Six's blood, ice-shaped fixtures that petrify and turn their targets into dust, and this creepy-looking long-armed janitor who pursues children so that their bodies can be sent to the kitchen, cooked and eaten by these creepy-looking gluttonous people that look right out of Spirited Away. In addition to this, Six will become stricken by hunger, doubling over in pain and becoming ravenous until she can eat meat again and return to normal. This hunger state becomes more intense later on, leading Six to eating things like rats and friendly gnome creatures. These examples only scratch the surface of the unnerving and unsettling themes and imagery portrayed in series like Little Nightmares. Like with the piles and piles of shoes that no longer have owners and the carved messages and lines in the wall that really bring up images of Auschwitz and other horrible things from World War II that I don't know if I can even get too much into. All of this is happening to defenseless children who can only run and hide from the horror, all while confronting the trauma they are certainly not equipped to understand or deal with. Since the game story is so vague, yet the setting and atmosphere is so rich with detail, there has been much speculation to what it all means. Despite my previous comments about how obtuse the story is to understand, what makes it all cohesive and worth playing in my opinion is the expertly crafted environmental storytelling, which is present across the entirety of the Little Nightmares franchise. Bendy and the Ink Machine is an indie horror game which takes place over five parts and tells the story of a retired animator, Henry Stein, as he receives a mysterious information from his former employer to return to the animation studio to see something important. What Henry Stein finds is an ink machine with the power to bring cartoon characters to the real world and a cult that worships these cartoons as gods. What's worse is that the ink machine is powered by human souls and may even be turning the employees and cartoonists themselves into the characters. Bendy and the Ink Machine is not the most disturbing game out there, however, due to the way the story was presented, it took the internet by storm, with merch often seen on the shelves of Hot Topics everywhere. It's, again, not the most disturbing, but there's plenty of room for speculation and discussion, which is why this game has endured for so long. We Happy Few is a Kickstarter game that actually got a full release, despite some mixed reception along the way. Taking place in an alternate timeline where in World War I the Germans successfully took Britain over, everyone in the town of Wellington Wells takes a pill called Joy in order to forget the very bad thing, which is an event where the population of Wellington Wells has turned over all children under the age of 13 in exchange for their freedom. With this being Germany, and we're seeing lots of trains, you can see what they're alluding to. The joy pill also can inflict other side effects such as horrifying hallucinations, short-term memory, and a dazed state that makes one susceptible to manipulation and propaganda. Some characters over time develop a resistance to this drug, which eventually becomes our playable characters. Arthur Hastings, a censor who remembers that he stole his older brother's identity in order to avoid a very grim fate. Ali Startsky, a veteran accompanied by a hallucination of his dead daughter, confusing many of the cast when playing through their routes and Sally Boyle, a mother trying to protect her child while also dealing with the abusive men in her life. Most of the characters in this game don't end up being great people. In fact, most of them in some shape or form have regrets about the actions they took during the very bad thing, yet remain pragmatic about their oppressive situation. These people aren't really trying to stop an overarching bad guy as much as they are just trying to move on from their trauma and the aisle by escaping it. Not only literally, but figuratively as well. Doki Doki Literature Club is a spoof on dating simulator visual novels that opens with a severe content warning, immediately putting the player at least a little on edge. Beyond that first red flag, 
you're presented with that classic premise of an after-school club with a short cast of dateable girls with easy to understand personalities. This scenario is turned on its head, however, as things gradually become more corrupted as time passes, with the characters and poems they write for the club becoming more and more strange. This culminates in the best friend character hanging herself, which the player blames himself for. This is definitely the most disturbing scene in the game, since it's easy to empathize with someone who had no idea their friend was suicidal. As it turns out, one of the game's dateable characters has become aware and is manipulating things behind the scenes in order to eliminate the competition. This one will especially come as a shock to you if you go in blind as a fan of dating simulators, or at least know their tropes. There is more story here to dive into with clues included in the game's files, though we'll leave that to the message boards. Cry of Fear began as a total conversion mod for Half-Life 1 title Afraid of Monsters. Both these games are well worth playing and contain unsettling themes related to drug addiction to the point that painkillers are the only way to recover your health a la Max Payne. Using the 17-year-old Source engine, Cry of Fear creates a surprisingly immersive yet oppressive atmosphere, especially when you consider that Afraid of Monsters was created by a 12-year-old over two years. The deserted town filled with monsters represent the delusions and psychological trauma of the game's main character, Simon. He begins his story caught in a loop of anxiety, depression, and despair, only for things to get worse when he is crippled by a car crash, adding isolation to his list of issues, further pushing him into the dependency of painkillers. One of Simon's doctors, who also acts as his therapist, encourages him to write a book about what he feels. This implies that the game is Simon figuratively facing off against the trauma and damage that causes his despair trying to process and reconcile his negative emotions. An example of this is the optional boss Carcass, who appears as a mass of flesh and stubby limbs suspended in a chair, mirroring a quote from the crippled Simon who claims to feel like a loaf of meat in a chair. In addition to symbolism like this, Cry Fear also does a great job of creating feelings of loneliness and dread despite its limited engine, helping you to put yourself in the shoes of the depressed and suicidal main character. Again, the original was made by a kid for free, and is one of the best mods for Half-Life, and cited as one of the best freeware horror games, period. It's crazy what talent combined with horror can sprout. Baldi's Basics is a pretty easy game to understand, at least on the surface. It's a spoof of those old educational games you may have played in a computer lab 10 to 20 years ago, except now it's a horror game. Originally beginning life as a game jam game, Baldi's Basics captivated the internet as the Let's Players tried their best to survive the marathon sprint out of the school while solving simple math problems. Each math problem you get wrong makes Baldi move a little bit faster, and each notebook will always have an impossible question. Obstacles make staying away from Baldi and his tendency to jump scare the player much more difficult and stressful. There might be a story here involving human souls and corrupted data which leads to the low fidelity graphics of the game, but it will take a smarter person than I to try to actually decipher it. The perversion of what is traditionally used as a teaching implement is what makes this game a little uncomfortable. However, since it's so popular, it's hard to see Baldi as anything more than a meme nowadays. Although, looking strictly at the game itself, there's a lot to be uncomfortable with. Silent Hill is a series that needs no introduction. When it comes to video game horror, the first two titles that should pop into every horror enthusiast's head are Resident Evil and Silent Hill. In the wake of survival horror's inception, the first two Resident Evils by Capcom became instant classics, which still get resold and remade to this very day. Rival company Konami was eager to toss their own hat in the ring with a franchise of their own to get their own piece of that sweet pie that was the budding legacy of survival horror. They established Team Silent and told them they required a game that appealed to Western sensibilities and that it needed to be as Hollywood and flashy as Resident Evil was. The developers got straight to work and produced not only an answer, but also a straight up rival to the series they were competing with. Silent Hill is a psychological nightmare that is so dense with brutal imagery and heart-pounding environments that it brought about its own series of comic books, many sequels, and two Hollywood films with dubious quality depending on which one you watch. The legacy of Silent Hill is one synonymous with the term legendary, with iconic monsters like the Bubblehead Nurses, Pyramid Head, Vaultiel, Twin Victim, hell, even Robbie the Rabbit inspires terror, 
On top of that, some monsters like Robbie and Valtiel are just in the background. Some have criticized Silent Hill for constantly recycling their more legendary monsters, such as Pyramid Head. What makes Silent Hill pretty cool is the fact that, at least for the first three games, the monsters and horrors are centered around the main protagonists and their unknown past, traumas, even sins. For example, when Pyramid Head appears, he represents James Sunderland's guilt specifically, which is why he does not make sense in the Silent Hill films, which imports him at wholesale into someone else's story simply because he's iconic and popular. The same is true for Dead by Daylight. This is James's monster, and well, we see this guy pop up in everyone else's games too. As for the games people talk about the most, Silent Hill 1, 2, and 3 aren't just games where you juggle your resources and yelp at jump scares. It's an experience that gets inside your head and makes you question everything you see and encounter. The fear it inspires isn't just cats jumping out of lockers, but actually having the guts to kill said cat then recreate the same scene later when the world shifts with truly disturbing effect and even begins to border on meta. You never know what's waiting around every corner, and the themes you are faced with become increasingly Freudian as you descend deeper and deeper into the town of Silent Hill. The series is said to have peaked with the first sequel for PS2. However, there are many interesting Silent Hill games outside of the mainline franchise, such as Shattered Memories for the Nintendo Wii. The atmospheric immersion in the series is simply suffocating. Akira Yamaoka's soundtrack balances industrial soundscapes, ambient decay, and pure unadulterated silence that leaves you constantly looking over your shoulder. Occasionally, Silent Hill throws terrifying sounds at you in places that are entirely without consequence just to make you question the level of danger you are actually in. You can play these games, and you can get lost in their world very easily. But what you can't do is play these games very easily. I mean, your options are a discounted disc version of the original games for PC, which can be hard to find, the Silent Hill HD collection, which did not remain faithful to the originals, and doesn't even include the first game that fans fell in love with in the first place. Even some of the fonts used in-game were replaced with Comic Sans, along with other unfortunate technical errors present due to loss of the original source code. Your next option to visit Silent Hill is legal emulation or playing on original hardware, or a backwards compatible PS3. Considering the PlayStation 2 is over two decades old, acquiring original hardware might not be feasible for most people, and definitely does not bode well if you want to start with Silent Hill 1, which would require PlayStation 1 hardware. Here's to hoping we can get some sort of PC remake because right now, it seems Konami is more focused on pachinko machines than returning to the foggy vistas of Silent Hill with a new mainline entry, despite a cacophonous demand from the series' fans. I'm going to be completely real with you. If you guys, like, enjoy roguelikes and enjoy horror or Junji Ito, you need to pick up World of Horror right now because this game has been infecting my life. To start, World of Horror is a turn-based Call of Cthulhu-inspired game that tasks the player with playing through five of the game's partially randomized mysteries in order to stave off one of the Elder Gods which threaten Shiokawa, Japan. This game is especially notable for its art style, which blends elements of J-horror a la Junji Ito with one-bit graphics that tease the imagination. This art style is used to great effect when depicting the game's many monsters, working with within the constraints of a limited color palette and pixel count to provide enough detail to be unnerving without going overboard on the it's so retro, look at how horrible our game looks and plays. The trial and error style of gameplay means that your first round of investigators are pretty much guaranteed to have a horrible end, ranging from injuries to attacks by parasitic organisms and curses which warp both the human body and mind into something unrecognizable. As turns pass and your investigations carry out, your doom level rises, representing an existential threat always drawing closer and closer to the end of life as we know it, or at least in the case of our game, the end of the run. This leads us to one of the most disturbing aspects of World of Horror, and Lovecraft-inspired fiction in general. There's no real true victory for the investigators. Sure, you may be able to hold off the old gods for now, but at a steep cost, and through all your effort and suffering, all you can really hope to do is delay the inevitable. Created by Silicon Knights, Eternal Darkness is a classic horror game for the Nintendo GameCube. This part is notable because, well, 
the GameCube marketed itself to families and kids, and as a result, mature games didn't sell very well. If you're interested in hearing more about that, Matt McMuscles did a great retrospective on what happened. Inspired by Lovecraft, Eternal Darkness features a wide cast of characters that span across human history. Each character that takes a stand against the cosmic eldritch forces, much like in the Lovecraft tales, will meet an unhappy end. Rather, it's through unpleasant physical means or mental damage leading to insanity. Each generation passes on a slim yet bigger chance for salvation for the next. Eternal Darkness is very cinematic. It features rather interesting methods to scare the player, usually involving breaking the fourth wall. As your sanity meter drains, a number of bizarre effects can be triggered, like the game claiming your save has been corrupted, or the screen turning off, or a variety of other hallucinations experienced by both you and the character you play. Unfortunately, Eternal Darkness is actually rather easy meaning that most players won't even have a chance to see these effects unless intentionally trying to trigger them. Regardless, despite the fall of Silicon Knights due to a lawsuit with Epic Games, and yes, that Epic Games, Eternal Darkness has been a classic staple for many scary video game lists and is considered to be the most horrifying game to be directly published by Nintendo. There are some really cool ideas here, but unfortunately, they may never be fully explored. Duck Season found a way to make Duck Hunt actually unsettling. To start off, you'll need a VR setup if you want to experience the game as intended. Sporting seven endings and plenty of collectibles to find, Duck Season is a coming-of-age story set in 1988 where you play as a kid who got to rent a cool new video game which is inspired by Duck Hunt. Using your VR controls, you are tasked with shooting the ducks out of the sky while this creepy dogman cheers you on. For the majority of the game, you are playing Duck Hunt in VR while occasionally getting spooky messages and cheesy 80s references. Where this game gets disturbing is in the endings, which again are all happening to a child that just wants to play a video game. Funnily enough, if you never shoot the duck season dog, you can bypass all the disturbing content and get the non-canon fiesta ending where everything is fine. In the canon ending, however, the kid's mom is murdered by the dog which had been stalking the kid. Even after you defeat him with your NES blaster, the kid reasonably assumes the police won't believe his story, so he buries his loving mother and goes on the run. There are other twisted and joke endings, but this is the canon one, and it's something that some may find unnerving to this day. Manhunt isn't your typical Rockstar game. After Grand Theft Auto 3's success, Rockstar, the developer, made another game which is less talked about these days, but should be considered far more disturbing and controversial than other titles that these developers made like Bully or the Grand Theft Auto series, which in and of themselves sparked nationwide debate about the government's role in the game's industry and furthermore, the censorship of media. In 2003, Rockstar released a stealth horror game called Manhunt, where you take on the role of James Earl Cash, an inmate on death row who, on the night of his execution, finds himself awakened in a seedy underbelly of Career City, where he's forced against his will to kill gang members on CCTV cameras for the sake of producing snuff films, for the producer only known as the director. The snuff element isn't something that this game shies away from either. When you take on your enemies, you murder them with plastic bags, razor wire, baseball bats, and more. As you sneak up on your victims, you have to build your meter to determine how brutal the kill will be. To put it in plain, simple, layman's terms, Manhunt is a game that directly rewards you with more points and a especially bloody animation should you take your time with stalking your victim, encouraging the player to put themselves into the same mindset as a snuff film producer. The enemies you kill will vary from Nazi skinheads to street thugs in monkey costumes to chainsaw-wielding lunatic pigmen in a pig costume. As you murder, the director grows more eccentric in his pleasure at watching your work, even going as far as to orgasm towards the end of the game. Even for the PS2 limitations, the gore is still shocking today as it was when it first came out. Manhunt 2 followed shortly after, however was heavily censored, removing some of the more provocative elements like the scoring system or the ability to clearly see what kind of murder you're doing. 
The controversy surrounding Manhunt 2 begun two days after its announcement before any footage or information on the game had been released. The initial discussion focused on the fact that the first game had been inaccurately connected to a murder in the United Kingdom, which prompted anti-video game activists and lawyers like Jack Thompson to use that tragedy and exploit the victim's parents' grief in order to make a name for themselves. This only got worse when the BBFC and IFCO refused to even rate the game. This is what they had to say on the subject. Rejecting a work is a very serious action, and one that we do not take lightly. Where possible, we try to consider cuts, or in the case of video games, modifications. In the case of Manhunt 2, this had not been possible. Its unremitting bleakness and callousness of tone in an overall game context, which constantly encourages visceral killing with exceptionally little alleviation or distancing, Manhunt 2, on either platform, would involve a range of unjustifiable harm and risk to both adults and minors within the terms of the Video Game Recording Act. Personally, I think that these people don't give us enough credit. I think that as video gamers, a lot of us have a pretty good mental fortitude against the idea of becoming a brainwashed snuff film addict, and I don't really feel like there's any risk at all. So we obviously disagree with the BBFC's assessment, and Video Games' as art has gone a long way since that decision. Still, at least in 2007, Manhunt 2 was pushing what was even acceptable to publish with its distressing and shocking content. And it looks like you've made it through layer one. Now, I just want to let you guys know that I'm going to be going back and fixing anything that I missed. For example, I've already missed Among the Sleep and Agony, which will be on layer two. It's just that it's been two months since I've uploaded a video, and I don't want to delay it another day just so I can, well, fix the botched recordings I did earlier. I'll have a link to the full iceberg in the description. Be sure to read it, and if you have suggestions make sure that it's not on that image who knows maybe i'll be crediting you in the next video with that said layer two is indie horror indie horror is classified as any game that is disturbing but pretty well known while made by either a small studio a small group of people independent developers or just a game that has a smaller scope compared to the more mainstream games basically we are moving directly down one layer and the games are gonna reflect that. With that said, let's begin. What Remains of Edith Finch is a first-person narrative-driven game where you explore the Finch family home, living through the memories of deceased family members in their final moments. Superstitious family members believe this bad luck to be the result of a familial curse that causes untimely deaths. To give you an idea of how unlucky this family is, they finish the construction on their graveyard before even starting to build the house. This creates a lot of dreadful moments due to the realization that the character you're controlling in the memory sequence is going to die somehow. An example of this is the baby Gregory, who drowns in the bathtub after the player experiments and finds a way to turn the water back on after the bath was emptied. As the baby loses consciousness, we hear a narration of his father trying to comfort the mother after Gregory's death. Before Your Eyes is a game that simulates going through a whole human life in the blink of an eye. In order to play the game the way that it was intended to, you'll need a webcam which will run in the background. The software and the camera can detect when you blink, which moves time forward at specific intervals. This can be actually pretty intense in person, because much like the character on screen, you want to linger in that warm memory, learn what's going on, and partake in the potential narrative choices that the game sometimes offers. It's hard to keep your eyes open, and try as you might, you will blink early leading to some unfortunate events as time blinks forward. The narrative considers this and makes the game feel oddly reactive to you as an individual, literally putting you in the silent shoes of our protagonist as he too is confined to a chair and can only interact with the world through blinks. It's hard to get the full story and remember all the details when everything is boiled down to hazy snapshots. 
those warm moments that we felt before turn bittersweet when it's revealed that we are exploring the memories of a teen that got a terminal illness and died, losing out on what could have been the rest of his life. The majority of the game being a fabrication by the protagonist to trick the audience into believing that he had, well, done something with his life. This illness, which seems to be cancer, takes a toll on the main character, and he is forced to take medication in addition to other life-preserving devices to mitigate the effects of the disease. As the teen's condition worsens, his parents attempt to stay positive in spite of distresses and financial burdens on their current life. While being fully aware that he's going to die, we get to see him confront this reality and reach out to friends that he'll soon leave behind. Eventually, the medication's no longer able to delay the inevitable, and the teen finally dies, ending up in the afterlife, which is where the game begins. The human emotion on display is absolutely brutal, and depictions of death are not only abstracted, yet in some instances uncomfortably realistic considering the graphical style. To me, it was a existentially terrifying experience. If you have a webcam and want a hyper immersive story about coming to terms with death and what death actually means and what a human life can present, even one that hasn't had a chance to really make an impact, well, Before Your Eyes is probably one of the best games I've played in that regard. Hellblade Senua Sacrifice is an action-adventure game where you play as a Celtic warrior named Senua who inhabits a grim, dark fantasy world based on Norse mythology. The plot centers around Senua's journey to Helheim in order to rescue the soul of her dead lover and the otherworldly entities and challenges she encounters along the way. One thing that Hellblade strives to do is create an accurate representation of psychosis through Senua's struggles with the darkness and furies that reside in her head like a curse. These voices are best experienced with headphones on, as they utilize 3D sound to taunt Senua, cast doubt, and reveal aspects of her backstory. This creates tense moments of psychological horror, which were achieved by the developers working closely with neuroscientists, mental health specialists, and people living with the condition. Harvester is a 90s point-and-click adventure game that set out to be intentionally controversial in the wake of the violent video games debate. Developed by DigiFX, the studio wanted to make something high concept to compete with industry giants, so they made the most violent and controversial point-and-click game that they could. You play as a teenager named Steve Mason, who awakens in the town of Harvest USA in the year 1953 with no memories of his past or who he is. Everyone acts like parodies of people, overly violent and bizarre. Eventually, Steve is pushed to join the Lodge, where he is given a new job each day, beginning with seemingly harmless pranks that quickly escalate to theft and arson, with each job having unforeseen, often very messed up consequences that usually result in someone's accidental death, murder, or suicide. There is a scene where a group of kids are eating their own mother, and all the NPCs in this game can be killed, including the children. This game, unlike many others, does not shy away from the violence against anyone and everyone. It turns out Harvest is an elaborate virtual reality simulator being operated by a group of scientists in present time to determine if it's possible to turn average humans into serial killers through a video game. Yeah, it's, it's pretty on the nose. There are two endings, one where the violent murder simulator turns you into a killer, and the other one is where you get a happy ending. As of today, I guess Harvester has a bit of a cult following, but overall after playing it and experiencing it for myself, I think it's best consumed in a stream or just like watching a let's play on the internet. Anatomy is one of the most popular games created by Kitty Horror Show for the website itch.io. Many of Kitty's games explore the theme of haunted spaces, taking a place which may be recognizable and twisting it to evoke a feeling of dread. Anatomy is no exception, attempting to place the player in a situation which, at the same time, is familiar, yet malevolent. Much of the gameplay involves moving from room to room in an abandoned house, collecting and listening to tapes, which discusses the nature of homes and comparing them to human bodies, with rooms acting like organs to carry out vital functions. The game is separated into three segments. 
each of which end with the game shutting itself off automatically, only for more things to be wrong with the house the next time you turn it on. The first time you boot up the game, you may notice the odd door disappearing. However, booting up the game a second time causes furniture to begin inexplicably standing at odd angles and clipping into the walls while the tapes become warped and corrupted. Booting the game a third time leaves the house almost unrecognizable, with scrambled meshes, duplicated objects, and even veins connecting the various rooms. It is revealed that the tapes are the internal monologue of the house itself, which has come to resent you so deeply that it plans to kill you. And you are already trapped inside. The house itself has become untrustworthy, which is a scary thought since we depend on our homes for survival, trusting them to protect us from the elements to shut out intruders. Anatomy questions whether we've taken this trust too far and whether the homes we depend on are the ones truly controlling us. Mount Gecko's Castle is an RPG maker game centered around a girl named Yonaka. I'm hoping I pronounced that right, as she tries to evade capture by the Mangekos. The Mangekos are short yellow cat creatures with violent and perverted tendencies, acting as the game's primary antagonist with the goal of molesting and killing Yanaka. Like many other games of this type, there are a plethora of bad endings where the Mangekos achieve this goal. Oftentimes, these grotesque scenes are unavoidable due to the game leaning heavily in on trial and error segments. Violence is not limited to the main character who's a high school girl because, well, of course she is. The Mangekos are also regularly tortured and maimed. Take for instance, Mogeko, who crucifies Mogeko for fun and later becomes obsessed with the concept of skinning Yonaka alive. I. It's a pretty dark game, but, you know, it's RPG Maker, and I don't think the art is as intense, per se, as some of the later stuff in the iceberg. Still dark, and still one of the OGs. The Static Speaks My Name is a short artistic experience which calls attention to mental health issues by having the player control a paranoid schizophrenic man named Jacob during the last moments before taking his own life. Schizophrenia is often characterized by the way it blurs the line between what is real and what is not, and in the spirit of this, the game uses symbolism to represent symptoms of the disorder in order to show and not tell. The chains on Jacob's door represent the way he has isolated himself. Himself. A recurring painting represents his paranoid obsessions. You get the picture. Things get a little bit darker after the player discovers Jacob's suicide letter to his mother and are eventually tasked to decide what to do with the man in the cage. Whether the player decides to spare the man or electrocute him, they have to control Jacob as he follows through on his plan to end his own life afterwards. The game opens and closes with one of its most chilling visuals. A night sky filled with stars where each star represents another victim of suicide, revealing only the victim's name, age, and the method they chose. Soma is one long existential crisis of a game. It is the sixth title from Frictional Games and offers more of the same when it comes to the cat and mouse style of gameplay that modern horror has settled into. They spice up the pot by putting you in very uncomfortable positions that challenge your very perceptions on reality. Using hard sci-fi hypotheticals, the game brings to question the very nature of what it means to be alive. You play as Simon Jarrett, a recent survivor of a severe car accident who ends up walking away with irreparable brain damage and life-threatening cranial bleeding. Desperate to try anything, he sees a scientist about a brain scan, only to black out mid-procedure and suddenly wake up finding himself in an underwater facility about a hundred years in the future, surrounded by mechanical abominations that would love nothing more than to rip him to pieces. As the story unfolds, he realizes that not everything is as it seems, and that the very nature of the consciousness itself is very likely a manufactured construct and not the sacred thing we all grew up assuming it was. Ranging from navigating simulations to having to euthanize the last living human being on the planet, this game hits on an entirely different level and leaves you reevaluating your own perceptions of life. Kanye West 3030 seems to be mostly a meme on the surface, featuring a story where Kanye West is sucked into a wormhole to the year 3030, where he must assemble a team of rappers in order to beat a base god, Little B, and save America. For two years, an easter egg in the game flew under 
everybody's radar until it was discovered that through an Estern with an unnamed NPC you could access a different part of the game entirely which staged a mock cult recruitment for a group called the Ascensionists. By replying Ascend when asking what do you want to do, the player is turned into a butterfly and taken into a secret level with creepy music and more ARG puzzles to solve. At this point, you are also informed through an in-game text window that the game you had been playing is actually just a front intended to protect what you are currently assessing now, and that your test may or may not be restricted to the software of the game. Solving puzzles in this mysterious level presents the player with a final terminal that congratulates them for ascending, and informs them that you have proven your worth and gives the option to participate even further. The terminal claims that by selecting yes, you grant permission for the Ascensionists to interact with your possessions, and that over the next two weeks they may even try to contact you directly in the real world. Finally, the game will ask you to input personal information like your full name and address before sending this information to the Ascensionists. Of course, since RPG Maker games cannot communicate with the internet in any way, this sequence of events is likely to be a hoax as a part of a larger ARG that went dark nearly a decade ago. That said, this kinda blows Luna game right out of the water. The Binding of Isaac is a roguelike game inspired by the biblical story of the same name where Abraham was ordered by God to sacrifice his son. In the game, you play as a young and tragically nude Isaac as he flees into a trap door to escape his mother who heard a voice from above order her to sacrifice her son after too much exposure to Christian talk television. Understandably shaken by his mother trying to stab him with a knife from the kitchen, Isaac resorts to fighting enemies with his own tears, which he fires by crying using a control scheme similar to twin stick shooters. These enemies are often repulsive and disturbing, including flies and insects, other dead children, weird flesh growths given unholy life, and of course, sentient piles of poo. In addition to the gross enemies, many of the random items you can collect also alter Isaac in some way, carrying their own concerning implications, like a coat hanger which Isaac drives through his head, or various medications he misunderstands and abuses. The game also contains many endings, some of which imply that Isaac does not survive the attempted sacrifice or that he ended his own life after internalizing his mother's dogma. The Penumbra series began with the Penumbra Tech Demo, which was made to showcase the 3D capabilities of the HPL engine. The Penumbra Tech Demo would later be refined into Penumbra Overture, the gameplay of which inspired many of the staples of survival horror games like Amnesia, such as physics light puzzles, inventory and resource management, and using stealth to avoid a monster which roams the level. One key distinction, however, is that the player character in Penumbra is at an advantage in low light conditions which make him harder to detect and increase his night vision. Things begin to fall apart a little bit in the final game of the trilogy, Penumbra Requiem, which does away with the resource management and monster evading in order to double down on the worst puzzle solving elements. In spite of this, Penumbra is fondly remembered as one of the original modern horror games. Off is an RPG Maker game created by a French-speaking developer from Belgium called Mortis Ghost. This is probably one of the most renowned RPG Maker titles, and its influence cannot be understated. One thing that sticks out is its hand-drawn art style, which depicts many of the game's enemies and NPCs as surreal and unsettling creatures with odd expressions and freakish proportions. Off begins by having you, the player, control a person called the Batter who has the objective of eliminating all specters to purify the world. In order to accomplish this, the batter must go to each of the zones, eliminating every ghost he encounters along his path, eventually taking the fight to the guardian of each zone. While he seems justified at first in his actions, nobody in this world seems to be really happy anyway, you may start to question the batter's goals when you revisit zones you have purified, abandoned, and oddly lonely. Later, you discover that the world was created by a child who may or may not be the player's son. In order to complete the purification, you have to kill your own child and end the world by flipping a switch, literally and figuratively turning it off. 
The Graveyard is a short, artistic game where you control an elderly woman in a black and white filtered graveyard as she hobbles forward for a little over a minute before resting on a nearby bench. Rest for too long on the bench and a song will start to play in Belgian Dutch, where a man sings about people who died due to various medical conditions. During this song, the elderly woman will die on the bench. However, if you leave before the music progresses too far, you can hobble back the way you came and leave the graveyard. In this way, the game is more like an explorable painting or an alternative way to tell a story without words. Some have criticized the game for this very reason, arguing that there isn't enough content to justify a $5 price tag. The Lisa trilogy follows different members of the Armstrong family before and after an apocalyptic event known as The Flash caused all women to vanish, leading to the collapse of society as we know it. Despite the strange, fantastical, cataclysmic state of the world, in the latter two games of the trilogy, the apocalypse is used more as a plot device to explore cycles of abuse and the damage victims of abuse carry with them through the rest of their lives. Both Brad and Lisa are terrorized by their father Marty, who is a drunkard and a deadbeat. Not only is Marty a neglectful parent, but also just flat out beats his children, and is implied to allow strange men to sexually assess his daughter? This unfortunately leads to Lisa committing suicide in Lisa the First, an event which Brad Armstrong blames himself and carries the scars into adulthood and the second game. Brad attempts to cope with his past by turning to a drug named Joy, which causes the user to feel absolutely nothing. Though, the Joy has a side effect which can cause its user to transform into a twisted Joy mutant. Despite Brad's efforts to control his anger and regret during his story, they manifest in behaviors that push Brad away from his friends and loved ones. Worse yet, Brad sees himself as a tyrant and a jailer in his relationship with his pseudo-new daughter, Buddy, who Brad found and adopted, shutting her off from the rest of the world in order to protect her. Unable to fully control his emotions, Brad finds himself mirroring some of the same actions Marty took as he abused his children. Finally, in Lisa the Joyful, we see the effects of Brad's abusive relationship with Buddy as it causes her to lash out against the world in violent, drug-fueled outbursts just to prove that nobody can control her anymore. Pico School, a Flash game created in 1999, is a short point-and-click adventure game from Newgrounds.com. Back in the day when being edgy and irreverent were key to being cool, and while being satire, Pico School is certainly edgy. The plot revolves around a gang of kids calling themselves the Punk Rock or Goth Gestapo, who decide to take over Pico School and kill all the students and teachers with guns. Considering this is in the wake of horrible tragedies like Columbine, Pico features criticism towards the sensationalist anti-video game news coverage that follows these tragedies even to this day. The player takes control of Pico, a student who survives the initial attack and arms himself with a rifle from the janitor's closet before seeking his revenge. There are a number of boss fights, one of which involves a telepath who levitates the dead bodies of students before using them as projectiles. Clearly this is the result of someone just trying to push as many hot buttons as possible or make the most messed up thing that they can think of by not taking anything seriously. The plot of the game becomes confused when Pico alternates between using outrageous overkill to get revenge on the goth to suddenly morally grandstanding and protesting the violence. Finally, the game ends on a tasteless joke about Pico needing to defend himself once again when students are busting from the ghetto to replace the ones who died. This game was made 20 years ago by a young Tom Fulp who would eventually go on and make some of the best games of all time, like Castle Crashers and Battle Block Theater. Imagine he was frustrated with the news media just as much as we are whenever we hear a Jack Thompson type rears his ugly head. If you can handle this kind of humor, then this is a pretty okay early Flash game. That said, it's unsettling looking back given the benefit of hindsight.
Psycho no Stoka is a survival horror game which is based on a trope of Japanese romantic fiction called Yandere, which is almost like their version of the Psycho Girlfriend. Like a few games towards the top of our iceberg, this game enjoyed popularity on YouTube and Twitch because of its prevalence among streamers, which has softened the game's edge. In Psycho no Stoka, you have been captured by the girlfriend and are being held captive at school, which you need to escape while your captor lurks in the halls with a knife. If you're discovered, the Psycho Girlfriend will give chase and try to kill you with her knife. What makes this game disturbing is that the girlfriend character seems to be aware of her actions, but unable to control them. In the brief moment of lucidity after catching the player and stabbing them for the first time, the girlfriend is mortified by her actions and pleads for you to run while giving you the game's only healing item. While there isn't much here on its own that's very disturbing, there's something to be said for how the game expands on the Yandere trope with a character who is horrified by her own obsession. And I don't know how I fall asleep. The Beginner's Guide, narrated by Davey Weirden, the creator of The Stanley Parable, but also fictional character within the lore and realm of this game, takes you through the collective works of a fictional game dev named Coda. Game by game, this narrator talks about the mechanics each game has and what they say about the creator itself. Over time, you realize that the narrator is actually just grasping at straws and keeps referencing heated arguments that he would have with Coda. Eventually, this all culminates in the final game that Coda made, which is buggy and contains a impossible maze which the narrator can't even bypass without modifying the game itself in order to get you to the other side. The Beginner's Guide does an astounding job hiding its true horror to the point that many people who will comment on this video will disagree with its inclusion at all. But the big twist at the end that really kind of fucks with me to this day is the fact that the narrator had been been stalking and harassing Coda as a malignant part of his life and had tried to enlist you, the player, into helping find him, so that this harassment could continue. In some aspect, the narrator is an interesting and tragic character, unable to read the room and boundaries before him. From his perspective, he's just doesn't understand why his friend stopped responding. However, since the game is from Davy's perspective, it would make sense that it's sympathetic to his point of view. The sad reality is, however, is that Koda is trying to escape a toxic friendship and the narrator is going through some very disturbing lengths to keep him around. The Beginner's Guide ends with a long message, and you can choose to completely ignore it if you want. Reading this for the first time actually uh, messed me up a little bit, and really shows that cyberstalking can be pretty freaking scary too. The fact is, this narrator was willing to ignore Coda's wishes and constantly showed people his work, despite how bad it made Coda feel. The line, giving them something that is not yours to give, violating the only boundary that keeps me safe, while the narrator says, I'm the reason that you stopped making games, aren't I? It's because of what I did. I poisoned it for you. I don't think I ever told you this, but when I took your work and I was showing it to people, it actually felt... <laughs> it felt as though I were responsible for something important and valuable. And the people who played them, they treated me like I was important. They really listened and cared about what I had to say. Even though I was showing your work, it was... I felt good about myself. Finally. For a moment, while I had that, I liked myself. Shows just how bad this relationship was. This game holds a special place in my heart because it made me feel a full rainbow of emotions even beyond the disturbing elements and helped me process a very similar situation. The Beginner's Guide also has commentary about what it's like to make something and how much of yourself you can give to your audience. Sometimes when there's a toxic entity in your life, the best thing you can do is to cut it out before it takes up too much space in your head. And that could be just the best thing you could do for not only yourself, but your mental health. And man, could I have saved myself a lot of headache had I learned that lesson just a little bit earlier. I know I screwed up. If I apologize to you truly and deeply, will you start making games again? Please. I need to feel okay with myself again. And I always felt okay as long as I had your work to see myself in. I mean, is, 
well, is something wrong with me? Because I know that I did an awful thing, and I'm doing it again right now. Like, I'm, I'm showing people your work, but I can't stop myself from doing it. That's how badly I need to feel something again, like I'm an addict. There has to be something wrong with me. Can I apologize? What if I tell you I was wrong? Will that work? Will that fix it? I, I, I don't know. I don't think it will, but there's nothing else that I can do. Just tell me what you want. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Please. Start making games again. Please help me. Please give me some of whatever it is that, that makes you complete. I want whatever that wholeness is that you just summoned out of nothing and you put into your work. You were complete in some way that I never was. Paratopic is a short sci-fi horror game intended to be played more than once in order to grasp the whole story. It can be tough to tell which character in the story you're playing as at any moment. The events are told dramatically out of order anyways, so clues which may be hidden in plain sight won't mean anything to you until you play the game a second time. Mandalore also did a fantastic video talking about some of the more obscure features this title offers. The fact that the narrative is so difficult to follow in addition to how surreal the game's setting and presentation is makes it feel like you're playing a nightmare complete with bizarre dream logic. From our best attempts at deciphering, the story revolves around an organization called The Power Company, which attempts to tap into another dimension to siphon their energy, only to bring something far more dangerous into our world. These extraterrestrial creatures seem to be able to disguise themselves as humans, though it's difficult to tell if these are aliens attempting to blend in with limited success, or humans being corrupted by the VHS tapes which these creatures use as a food source. Can also have all kinds of different effects on humans. The VHS VHS tapes, which are implied to be like a cross between an active drug and a snuff film, can also have all kinds of different effects on humans, such as dramatic shifts in their perception of reality, turning them inside out until they are sent to a different dimension, or maybe even transforming them into something completely different from human. While there are many great scenes of horror in Paratopic, what we find most disturbing is the idea that something which lurks outside of our dimension can be brought in and send our fragile reality crashing down. Calm Time is a hybrid 2D 3D horror game which casts the player as the host of a party turned surprise serial killer. The sudden reveal is shocking on a blind playthrough, but things quickly spiral out of control when your kill is witnessed by another guest who incites a panic. After cutting the power in the basement, where the corpse of another victim is chained to the wall, it's the player's job to hunt down the remaining guests and stab them to death. In addition to running for their lives if the player gets too close, the guests will try to hide, and even start to plead for their lives when they are injured. These reactions to the player's killing spree are the most messed up when you see them being carried out by one of the victims who is just a kid. Night in the Woods is not a traditional horror game. In fact, a lot of the horror comes from themes that it presents and the ideas that it implants in the player's mind, as opposed to anything outright inside the game itself. To be completely fair, at times, Night in the Woods can be downright hilarious, so I can see why people wouldn't view this as a horror disturbing game. That said, unlike other games on our iceberg, Night in the Woods has an intense focus on presenting small town Americana and perverting it as we take a critical look at society through the eyes of our protagonist May. May is a college dropout, with deeply scarring emotional problems that make her prone to violent outbursts and fits of manic depression. Whether we're talking about Greg and Angus struggling with being the only gay people in town, or B dealing with the death of her mom and her dad's subsequent refusal to live in reality, or May coming back home to a house that no longer welcomes her, there's plenty of of deeply disturbing topics that are explored within this title, all hidden under a veneer of quirky humor. Dropping out of college was supposed to be May's way to return to something familiar, but unfortunately everything is changing, and the footing that May thought she would find in her hometown all goes to hell. While all this is happening, May has to come to terms with the fact that her friend group is all moving on with their lives, threatening to leave her behind in what is repeatedly presented as a dying town. This is an existential fear that I personally have, while others may not. To give context, I come from the Rust Belt, which is where Night in the Woods takes place, and a lot of the sights and images and unsettling fears presented within it are uniquely 
relatable to people who are from my area. All this leads to Mei becoming stagnant in her situation while also dealing with this undiagnosed mental illness. This only compounds her issues when a murder cult starts kidnapping and killing people in the town of Possum Springs, all in service to the eldritch god known as the Black Goat, which is a reference to Shubnigaroff by Lovecraft. I think the game being set during fall is especially thematic. For May, everything but her is changing, and the story is about learning to accept that change for better or for worse, and it's not until May accepts this reality and responsibility that the story unceremoniously ends, leaving us with a bittersweet taste as our characters are as uncertain about the future as we are. Nothing's really solved, some people might have died, and all the problems we got to learn about intimately with the infrastructure and societal issues that May has to face are still there, weighing heavily on the shoulders of her cast. I actually made a video talking about why this game means so much to me, especially now more than ever before. Night in the Woods touches on several anxieties that I have and features a character that feels a lot like me and that has had a rippling effect on my life. For example, anything that had meaning at all will hurt to lose, so when you do, you're going to want it to hurt. And when I was dealing with my dog literally dying while making this video, I looked at my tattoo and it, it helped. It, it genuinely helped to think about it in that way. And that's the beauty of disturbing media. It's something that can help you deal with trauma and that's just why I love these games so much. They, uh really do help contextualize trauma and pain in a way that can make it feel just a bit more manageable. And Night in the Woods exemplifies all of that, at least for me. I literally have talked about this game for an hour before, so next item. And the next item is the end of the video. I apologize for not uploading in two months. I've been going through some personal crap and I assure you that is not the schedule moving forward. I would like to thank a few of the voice actors that lended their talent to this project, specifically Twin from my Discord server, who is just really funny. Backpack, who makes Guilty Gear guides and is the only damn reason why I know how to play Gold Lewis, and also someone who helped contribute their voice last minute. And Jameson, who did the Silent Hill segment, who is actually the voice for Metal Retzko, he's the guy who you hear screaming a lot, and he's done so many other things, and the fact that he's just like willing to help me with this project just... It genuinely means the world to me, and I'd like to point you guys at some of his music, because it's actually pretty good. He, he goes under the name Epsilon Zero, and I'll have the link in the description as well as in the comments below for anyone interested. He does some really good stuff in whatever genre he feels like doing. He's genuinely a music prodigy. I'm just grateful that I'm surrounded by some of the most amazing creators on the internet and that they're willing to lend their voice to me. Like Mandalore who, the Dead Space segment where he said that he's protesting the script and I'm like, well, you know, I trust his opinion more than my own so I left it in there. <laughs> I hope he doesn't mind. And finally, this video would not have been out on time or really probably at all if I didn't have the help of my editor friend Chris Lotus, who is not only a good training partner in all the fighting games that I play, but also just one of the most dependable guys that you can have around. This is a collaboration pretty much between me and him, and God, the man's a machine. I don't have a Patreon splash screen today because I'm having technical difficulties in that department. Also, there have been a lot of new people donating, and those people are genuinely awesome, and I will shout you out even if you stop donating between now and the next video. For those that don't know, we use the Patreon money to pay for the original music and the editors and general channel stuff that just help make these videos come out a bit faster and sounding a bit better. I always try to have a new song ready per video and none of that would be possible without the amazing 
folks at Patreon who are very kind and understanding with my weird upload schedule. Honestly, the point is, is that I'm grateful and I've been staying up all night working on this, trying to make edits, trying to make it get through, and well, I guess now it's time to end it and finally upload. So, so I've been your host at Creepy Reading, and I'm gonna go take a nap till the next one.